the movie portrays a, um, a family in the Great Depression, and Russell Crowe is the father. And it's the story of, um, you know, his son steals this sausage uh, from, the, from the local butcher. And so he immediately takes uh, the son over back to the butcher to return the sausage. Um, and the son is worried that, you know, he's going to be sent away you know, to live with somebody else because their family doesn't have enough money. Um, so there's two very different perspectives on display here in the, you know, in this video clip. The first is the boy. He's fearing uh, the situation. Uh, he's going to be separated from his family. Um, he sees chaos and pain uh, all over the place. Um, it's kind of easy to imagine what he would feel like. Um, some people are really scared right now and have been scared uh, because of the virus situation that we've been in. Um, it's kind of easy to relate to what the boy's going through. <clears throat> but there's another perspective on display in the video as well, and that is the perspective of the father. So it's persistence, hope. Uh, the father saying to the boy that no matter what, they're not gonna sell their dignity and honesty no matter how bad the situation gets, they're just not going to do it. And so he can kind of see the bigger picture that there's more to just the moment. Uh, the father knows something that the child doesn't. Um, he understands the battle's not over. It's not even close. Um, so by bringing this perspective into the relationship with the son, um, you know, he's able to provide assurance and he's able to provide hope. Um, things aren't as bad as they appear. And so the Apostle Paul, at the end of his letter to Romans, uh, he echoes this sentiment. I want to share this, these verses with you. <clears throat> Romans 15.1 says, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says that scriptures, the Bible, the Holy Bible that we are all holding in our hands, would be a source of encouragement, endurance, and hope. Listen to those words this morning. Cling to the scriptures and they will give you this. That's what Paul's telling us. So the book of Romans here was written about the end of Paul's third missionary journey. And we just concluded uh, his third missionary journey uh, in chapter 21. Uh, we're moving into chapter 22 now. So it's about coinciding uh, with the point uh, that we're in in the book of Acts. And so Paul is pushing on to Jerusalem. After he gets done with the third missionary journey, he's pushing on. Um, and within a week of being there, a mob tries to like uh, grab him and kill him. And so then we're introduced to this. Roman commander, uh, Claudius Lysias. Uh, he enters the fracas and he uh, saves Paul from the crowd um, and he arrests him, but he saves him from the crowd. And so this is where uh, we see in Acts 21, the commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing, some another, and since the commander could not get at the truth, because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the voice of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, away with him. Paul was able, at this point, to reason with the commander and somehow he was able to convince the commander to let him speak to the crowd. So he speaks to the crowd in Aramaic. 
the commander didn't understand what Paul was saying. Um, and here's the next section. The commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks because the crowd tried to get him again. He directed that he be flogged and questioned in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. So this commander, Claudius, we find out in the next chapter what his name is, he saves Paul's hide here for the second time from this crowd that's trying to, trying to mutilate him. Um, and he can't understand what the issue is, but he keeps pulling Paul out of this crowd. And that's where we pick up our section for today. <clears throat> Acts 22.30 says, The next day, since the commander wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and ordered the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to assemble. Then he brought Paul and had him stand before them. Now, Claudius, as we've said, he can't figure this out, you know, what's going on. Um, he thought that we could read more back in verse 22 or 21, or chapter 22, 21. He thought Paul was like some Egyptian he had heard rumor about who was leading a revolt of 4,000 terrorists uh, back in Acts 21, 38. Paul told him, no, I'm just a Jew from Tarsus. Um, the, the commander, you know, bails Paul out a second time. As we see down here, he wanted to have him flogged and questioned. Um, he decides to sleep on it. Uh, he wakes up the next morning and he says, all right, I don't know what's going on here. This is some kind of religious dispute with the Jews. I'm taking you to the Sanhedrin. I'm ordering the Sanhedrin to assemble. But one thing we need to take notice of here, three places in scripture within a chapter talks about the confusion of this Roman commander, Claudius. So when God repeats something, I think it's worth taking a few minutes and trying to figure out what he's trying to get your attention. So let's do that. So our faithful Claudius here, who keeps saving Paul, he's a little bit like our little boy from the movie clip that we saw. He doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't understand why the crowd is so mad at Paul. He doesn't understand why they would be so enraged as to want to kill him. Um, he doesn't understand the whole uproar going on in Jerusalem. He was assigned to keep the peace. And the peace is being disrupted by these crowds and Paul. Paul tried to explain it to the crowd or tried to reason with the crowd. He was speaking in Aramaic. Uh, the commander didn't understand Aramaic, <clears throat> so that didn't work. Um, in the midst of the chaos, this mob-like situation, this commander has no way to figure out what's going on. Can't make sense of it. The farthest thing from his mind at that moment is that there's the possibility of a sovereign God who's moving in the midst of this chaos to accomplish a purpose. This is not in the Roman commander's field of view at all. Uh, farthest thing from it. We as Christians, though, <clears throat> we're supposed to be able to see above our circumstances. We're supposed to be able to have, place our faith in a God who has larger purposes in our life. We're supposed to be able to see that. Yet sometimes we act a lot like Claudius. I mean, there's a lot of Claudiuses walking around in this world today. In our towns, uh, in our country, there's a lot of people like that. But the reminder of Claudius here should be a reminder to us that we can and we should see a larger purpose in what's going on in the world. We know that there's a sovereign God working out his purposes in the world. Sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. And looking at a guy like Claudius, who three times here is trying to figure out what's going on, that's a reminder to us. We know that there's a God who's working out his purposes. We know there's a God who calls us to have hope in the midst of chaos. He will never leave us or forsake us. Sometimes it's easy to forget that. Sometimes it's easy to forget that.
we have Jesus living inside of us. And that makes all the difference. We're going to see how this scene unfolds here in a minute. Paul's going to be drugged before the Sanhedrin. Whether Claudius gets his answers or not, we're going to see that. And we're going to see what a different perspective on these events might look like. Perhaps we each need a different perspective on events, a different perspective on what's going on right now in this world. Let's keep reading in our passage. <clears throat> Acts 23, verse 1. Paul's now drugged before the Sanhedrin. He looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. So the Sanhedrin is sort of like the Jewish Supreme Court. Uh, it's made up of the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Uh, this is like the, the ruling religious body and also governs uh, civil affairs in Jerusalem at that time. And so you get the impression that this whole thing is kind of thrown together at the last minute. The Roman commander, uh, Claudius, he's the one that called for this. Usually in the previous instances we've seen uh, in Acts, it's the Sanhedrin that brings themselves together to do something. In this case, it's Claudius bringing them together. Uh, so it's a little bit haphazard right at the moment. Uh, Paul, maybe, maybe an indication here is that normally the first thing that would happen in one of these trials is that they would read the charges against Paul. Well, you know, they didn't say anything, so Paul uh, does something that maybe, uh, you know, he just, like maybe Peter would have done. He just started talking, and he said, you know, I fulfilled my duty to God in good conscience. And so they were not happy with this. They ordered somebody standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth as a symbol that they weren't happy with what he said. Somebody from Ananias must have been thinking he couldn't conceive how somebody like Paul, a turncoat to the Jewish faith, running after this so-called Messiah, Jesus, how could he say that he had a good conscience and, he's conscience and he's fulfilled his duty? How could he say that? And now Paul was also drawing other, drawing other people away from him. On top of that, Ananias is thinking no one can keep the law perfectly. Come on. Who could say that they had a clear conscience before God with regard to keeping the law? Well, my dear Ananias, Allow me to introduce you to the gospel of Jesus. Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sins, all, for all who would turn to him in faith. We as believers can have a clear conscience. This is what Paul was saying. We can have a clear conscience not because we've kept all of God's laws perfectly or have lived sinless, but because we believe in someone, Jesus, who died on the cross to pay for our sins. That's how we can have a clear conscience. And that's what Paul was saying, I believe. Ananias didn't get this as, at all. So he says, uh, God will, and the, so then Paul responds. And again, Paul's being very much like Peter here. He just blurts this out, very bold. He says, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. So Paul's very bold in his response. He's basically saying, how can you, the one you're is accusing me right now of breaking the law, you're breaking the law yourself by saying that I should be struck before I have a fair trial. I mean, it was presumed at, in the Jewish legal system at that time, that you were innocent until proven guilty. So Paul is saying that they broke the law. Now, this reminds us, Paul being struck, uh, reminds us as a, of a time not too long before this where someone was also struck uh, when appearing before the high priest. Back in John 18, 
when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? I said something wrong, Jesus replied. Testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound, to Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus was also struck for defending the Jewish leaders, offending the Jewish leaders, and they didn't have a response to him. So then we keep going. Paul's surprised by what happens next. After he, after he makes this statement, a very bold statement to the, to the leader of the, of the priest, he says, those who were standing near Paul said, you dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. So if somebody calls Paul out and basically says, you shouldn't be talking to the high priest like this. Well, I think, you know, Paul immediately realized his error and he quotes scripture. He's quoting Exodus 22, 28, which says, do not blaspheme God or curse the ruler of your people. So Paul's basically saying, hey, look, I didn't realize this was the high priest. And this is another indication that this whole thing was probably just thrown together uh, because the high priest probably wasn't even wearing his robes, which Paul would have easily recognized him if he was wearing his robes. So this whole thing is just kind of like thrown together, here, not very organized. But Paul does take the high road. He apologizes. Um, and acknowledges his error. A pretty, pretty good thing that Paul did there. Um, but at this point, Paul is, it's starting to dawn on Paul that, look, I just opened up this trial by insulting the judge. The judge told somebody to strike me. Uh, what chance at this point do you think Paul has of having a fair trial at this point? Well, I'm sure he's thinking uh, pretty much zero. So he, he kind of does something really shrewd here at this point. Uh, he, seeks the, he, he seizes the opportunity to take the offensive again and to divide the court. So let's read what he does. <clears throat> Acts 23.6. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, <clears throat> my brothers, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out, surprise, surprise, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. So there's a little history lesson here. The Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. Here's our Roman commander again. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. So Paul took a bold approach here. He divided the Sanhedrin. Now, some have criticized Paul for this, that he shouldn't have taken this sort of worldly uh, approach. But Paul was a Pharisee, and he also recognized that the Sanhedrin had some Pharisees and had some Sadducees. And that there was, they didn't agree about the resurrection. And a central point about the gospel, about the, the resurrection, right? I mean, without the resurrection, you know, our faith is futile. And so Paul is kind of keeping with the gospel, but he's also doing something very shrewd here. He divided them. And he pointed out that after all, one of the main events here of the last 25 years, this is probably written about, uh, you know, this is written a few years later, but one of the main events was the resurrection, and he takes the opportunity to divide them on that point. It was legit. 
there was a great uproar. The Pharisees and the Sadducees went after each other like an MMA match, it looks like. They went, they completely uh, went after each other, probably physically, verbally. Uh, the Pharisees actually started defending Paul. Can you believe that? They actually started defending Paul. They said, we find nothing wrong with this man. Wow. And then they even went on to say, what if a spirit or angel has spoken to him? Well, they knew this would set the Sadducees off. And they may have been referring to what Paul just said to the crowd the day before in Acts 22. Let's look at that. The day before, he's recounting his testimony on the road to Damascus. And he says, after I had seen the light and went to Damascus and had my eyes open, then he says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. So the day before Paul said this, he said he saw the vision. And the Pharisees said, well, what if he did see a spirit or an angel? And they point that out. They're actually defending Paul. Now, maybe some of the Pharisees were secret believers. Like our old friend, remember our old friend Nicodemus? John chapter 3. Uh, we were reading about that in the Lord's Supper earlier. And he, he was also one of the people who, along with uh, Joseph of Arimathea, went to get Jesus' body. He was a Pharisee. Uh, I wonder if some of them were secret believers. Can you imagine watching the Supreme Court justices of the United States go at each other like this, physically or verbally? This is what happened. And in the midst of all this, there's this poor Commander Claudius. Isn't that beautiful? This guy who had no idea what was going on, he's trying, he figured, all right, I'll bring Paul before the Jewish ruling body. They'll tell, they'll explain what's going on. Uh, he, before the trial even gets started, it's over. They're in this physical fracas. Claudius has got to jump in and save Paul for the third time in two days from a mob who's trying to tear him apart. Once again, he whisked Paul away from the crowd, taken by force, back to the barracks, and Claudius still does not have his answer. He still doesn't know what is going on. He's still like that confused kid in the video clip at the beginning, he doesn't know what's going on. He needs the perspective of the father. He needs somebody to tell him what is going on. Our world is filled with these Claudiuses walking around. They need someone to share the gospel, somebody to bear witness as to where to look in a time of crisis. Claudius can't find that person. There's people walking around our world today who can't find that person to tell them, to point them to Jesus. Let's keep reading our last verse in this section. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. So this is at least the fifth vision that Paul's had in the book of Acts. The first was the granddaddy of all of them, right, where Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus. Blinding light led to Paul's conversion. This one, though, is pretty significant. And the fact that the Lord physically stood near Paul in the barracks while he's in chains. He came to Paul physically. The, this verse is key to understanding the whole passage. Jesus, you could have very easily imagined Jesus coming to Paul at this point and offering just a little criticism. He could have said, you know, why were you so stubborn to come back to Jerusalem? I told you to leave. And all the disciples led by the Holy Spirit told you to leave or not to come back. And yet you were doggedly determined to come back to Jerusalem. Maybe he could have criticized Jesus for rebuking the high priest, violating the law. Maybe he could have criticized Paul. Maybe Jesus could have criticized Paul or the little legal maneuvering he did 
trying to divide the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But there's not a word of rebuke from Jesus here. What does he say? He says, take courage. So Paul has had human failings. He's had willfulness. He's had loss of temper, perhaps. And Jesus comes to him and says, take courage. Imagine what kind of attitude that would instill in you to have Jesus come to you right after some kind of failing or sin and stand beside you and say, take courage. I've got your back, Paul. Don't worry. All those missteps you made, don't worry about it. You have to keep looking forward. Push into the next journey. Rome or bust, baby. That's what Jesus was saying to Paul. Take courage. We're going to Rome. Paul was probably exploding with courage at that point. He'd been given marching orders directly from the king. He knew the king was still in his corner. This appearance from Jesus to Paul was so pivotal, I believe, for Paul. It's certainly a different perspective than the Roman commander Claudius had, right? He was in this chaotic situation. He didn't see God's hand moving. Far, farthest thing from him, he saw chaos. He was looking for answers. As far as we know, he never found them. Lots of people like Claudius walking around. We want to be one of those people like Luke, who's explaining this story to us, or like Jesus, who comes to Paul and says, look, there's a bigger picture here. I know all you've been through. But guess what? We're going to Rome. We're leaving Jerusalem behind. We're going to Rome. I'm working out my purposes in your life. We have to be willing to step out and testify to that, that God has a bigger plan for people. We are Christ's ambassadors here on earth. We need to point the Claudiuses to Jesus. Just like the father giving that son a hug in that video clip at the beginning, we need to take the word of God to people and share with them and love them. As believers, we already know this. We already know Jesus is going to walk through us, with us, in difficult situations. We already know that Jesus is with us. He's never going to leave us. Now, we may not get to see Jesus physically as Paul did. But the scripture provides us with, what did Paul tell us in Romans 15 earlier? Endurance and encouragement so that we may have hope. Jesus will never abandon you in the night, no matter what. And that is what his appearance to, to Paul tells us. It's very significant that Paul would keep writing in Romans a verse like this. Romans 15, 13, he says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let those words sink in. You're not trying to conjure up some kind of hope on your own. You're not trying to do this on your own. You're getting this hope from the endurance and the encouragement of the scripture and the power of the Holy Spirit. What a great message here. What a great contrast we see between Claudius and Paul and Jesus and Luke, who's writing this. This idea of perspective, that perspective that God is working in the midst of this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work that you are doing in believers in this world. Thank you for the dear saints at Crossroads who just in the conversation I heard earlier, are concerned about people in this world that don't know you. Father, I pray that you would use us as a body to reach people in our community with the message and the hope of the gospel so that other people can get this endurance and encouragement and hope that comes from the scriptures and comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would be with us. Help us to carry your message of hope into the world today and this week. In Jesus' name, amen.